The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. So says the Lord Jesus Christ. Hello, welcome back to Bethel Evangelical Free Church Hanley on YouTube. I'm Pastor Gervais Charmley. I'm here once again with the uh, historic works of theology, the Cunningham Lectures, to talk about the really what this series has become is looking at the decline in many ways of Scottish theology, the changes in Scottish theology over a hundred years from 1861 when the lectureship was established through to 1960. The 1961 is here because of that's where it fits in the bookcase. I can't get it anywhere else. And in this this particular video I want to talk about the 28th series of Cunningham Lectures by John Dow, who was Professor of New Testament Exegesis, Emmanuel College, Toronto. Now, the volumes are always published under the title the lecture was given under. This is one of those examples. John Dow in the New College Edinburgh Centenary History. The title of the lectures is given as The Historic Jesus and His Gospel. The title of the published volume is Jesus and the Human Conflict. So it's not easy to work out that, oh, this has to be that book. However, I managed to track it down in spite of the title change, and then I realised, well, there probably are a number of these Cunningham Lecture volumes that uh, run around with a title other than the one given in New College, Edinburgh St. Anthony History. That's why I haven't been able to track them all down, I'm sure, although I have tracked down several like this one where the title is very, very different. Now, who was John Dow? I haven't been able to find, find out a great deal about him. John Dow was born in 1885. I'm not sure where, but it, he was a Presbyterian. And he was, in 1924, he was appointed Professor of New Testament at Knox College, Toronto. However, he stayed in post for a very, very short length of time because... In 1925, the Congregationalists, the Methodists, and the majority of the Presbyterians in Canada came together to form the United Church of Canada. It was one of the great church union schemes. There's a, because a similar scheme happens in Australia, for example. Um, you get the Methodist Union in England. Uh, and, of course, there is the great union of the... Church of Scotland of the United Free Church. But 1925, this union happens, and there is inevitably some conflict between those Presbyterians who say, no, we are staying out of the union, and those who want to go in. A major issue is the property of the church. Now, it's one thing when it's local congregations who say, well, we are a local congregation and we want to stay in the, the continuing Presbyterian Church in Canada. It's another thing, however, when it comes to the institutions, Knox College, the great seminary of the Canadian Presbyterians. There's a court case, and basically what happens is that Knox College stays... <clears throat> Knox College stays with the continuing Presbyterians, but a chunk of the faculty go into the United Church of Canada. John Dow was one of them. And this faculty meant that there was now this theological faculty without a building, without a college. They formed Union Theological College initially. But in 1928, Union Theological College, Toronto, decides it's not going to be a sort of floating college that exists simply because we've got these professors. It needs to have a home. And they're united with the theological faculty of the Methodist University, the uh, Victoria University, to form Emmanuel College, 
Toronto. So that's where Emmanuel College comes from. It's, it's very much this part of the whole church union scheme. And it's in that background, with that background, that John Dow is asked to come to Scotland, to Edinburgh, to deliver the Cunningham Lectures. It's been said that there are more Scotsmen in Canada than there are in Scotland. It has certainly been said there are more bagpipes in Canada than in Scotland, because there was a massive Scottish Highland exodus almost to Canada. Hence Knox College, hence the Presbyterians there, and hence John Dow. And so this Canadian professor comes to Scotland. He, he previously, yeah, well, he succeeded at Knox. William Manson, who went on to become a Cunningham lecturer, and also who went on to become the principal of New College, Edinburgh. Now his work is entitled Jesus and the Human Conflict, which actually is a much more understandable title than the historic Jesus and his Gospel. Because actually, it deals with something far bigger than simply a question about the historical Jesus. He writes, When I was invited to New College Edinburgh to give the Cunningham Lectures, I felt I might appropriately re-examine the gospel we had learned there in the light of the testing experience that had come to us all. He's talking about, the, of course, the First World War. Hence the theme, and these pages are more tentative than conclusive. He writes in the foreword, The true preparation of it for Jesus was the whole age-long experience of Israel. It's a wonderful opening sentence to say that the whole of the experience of Israel was a preparation for Jesus, because it's true. Jesus is the seed of Abraham who was promised. He goes on to write, apart from that discipline of the centuries, he is an enigma. Had he not come to crown the years of agony, the history of Israel would have sunk in tragedy. He was out of the midst of a suffering humanity that he, mu that he needs must come. For without understanding of the tears in things, he could be no saviour to draw all men unto him. Calvary did not merely decide the issue of a single combat. It was the culminating point of the universal human conflict, persisted in by men of faith, by faith of man rather through mists of tears and tempests of doubt, generation after generation. It was faith's victory at last on a field strewn with the tragic memorials of a sustained and desperate endeavour. It was the response of divine compassion to the long patience of the saints and the perfervid importunity of the righteous. It's a wonderful way to open this book, and it's a book that has many such glowing passages. He writes of the book of Job. Job carries the problem of sin and suffering right into the council chamber of the God of all the earth. Throughout the drama there is a searching after the creative mind behind all things, a probing into the secret purpose behind the mystery and majesty of the universe. As Moses kept the flocks of Jethro, casting his heart sorrow up into the great silence till the bush burned with the oracle, as Amos amid his quiet sheep and the groves of fig trees brooded in the presence of him who formeth the mountains and createth the wind, till he declared his thought. So Job from his ash heap flings his question up to him, who made Orion on the Pleiades, and he will have his answer from no lesser voice. It is not the commonplace philosophies of the earth that can soothe the soul. The only testimony he will own is the verdict from on high. It is on this count, on that count, that he will plead his cause, or that I knew where I might find him that I might come even to his seat. I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say unto me. And he goes through the history of Israel, the preparation, the glorious divine preparation, the attitude of the spiritual, apocalyptic. How does apocalyptic function? 
the choice of the cross, that Jesus chose to go there all the way to the cross of pain for his people, for us, and for our salvation. Did the early church win her victory by a policy of extension throughout the world by the gospel rather than achieve intention in Israel and in the individual? Can it be that the bold endeavour after so-called Christian communism as related in Acts had even more of the spirit of the gospel in it than the early missionary labours? There's a question the struggling. There's one of the points we must remember here. This is a book about struggle after the First World War. The First World War destroyed so many apparent, so many apparent certainties and left the world, yes, the Christian world too, with many questions and more questions than answers. One great shame was that Dow didn't recognise that the sea of faith was, to quote Arnold, withdrawing even at that point. Redemption by suffering love. And Jesus, agonistes. While the church has thus met the familiar temptations, and has often made grievous compromise with the forces of this world, she has always shown a marvellous power of recovery. She carries in her own bosom a standard by which she corrects her own errors. That standard is the person of Jesus. Again and again his face has been hidden under speculative ideas, and men have looked toward a perversion of him in church and the creed. But the awareness of a lost radiance seizes men from time to time, and a reference is made back to him. The real image is unveiled, and his truth carries its own evidence. Jesus is the best critic of his church, and her doctrine and development. A fresh study of him inevitably restores the emphasis to the ethical and spiritual, and doctrine gives up its buried gospel. He, not an idea, is saviour, and his message is redemption in man and in society, which is a wonderful thing to say, but what does it mean? Because... How do we know Jesus? We know Jesus through the Bible. So if we say, well, the Gospels, the Bible has obscured Jesus, then what we are saying is that there is no way to Jesus. But when we understand that the Gospels don't obscure Jesus at all, the Epistles don't obscure Jesus, they show him to us. What obscures him is philosophical speculation. Is speculation... And indeed, sometimes, some of the questions that have racked the church seem to us to be very odd questions. To give one example, the monothelite controversy. How many wills does Jesus have? Well, surely the response most people say, well, one, obviously, because he's, you know, he, he says, I always do the Father's will. Ah, but the monothelite controversy wasn't about that. It wasn't about whether he had a conflict of wills within him but about whether the human nature had the capacity to will. And you say, well, this is a very, very recondite question, and indeed it is. Sufficient to say that he is fully God and fully man, forever God, forever man, my Jesus shall endure. We do indeed look at the, the Gospels, and we must allow them to challenge our beliefs. We must allow Jesus to challenge us, to test us. The problem with so much of the historical Jesus movement of the early 20th century, and even today, is it's not about allowing the Jesus of Scripture to challenge us. Rather, it involves creating a, a different Jesus Albert Schweitzer says many strange things, but Albert Schweitzer's criticism of the historical Jesus quest bears repeating. Liberal theologians were like men looking into a well, and they looked into the well, and they imagined that the face they saw looking up was Jesus, when it was a reflection of themselves. Well, we say that's those liberal, those wacky liberals for you. Ah, but is that also something that can afflict people who believe themselves to be conservatives. We look not into 
a well to see our own reflections. We look into the Gospels to see a man who is unlike us, who challenges us, because he is forever God, forever man, because he is our Saviour and our Lord, and to him be all the glory. And he is the answer, and he is the helper in that true human conflict. Thank you for watching. May God bless you and keep you in his love and mercy. Amen.